Welcome back to Definitely Not Definitive. I'm Ken. And I'm Bethany. And we're just a fancy pansy couple in love that loves reacting to some Five Nights at Freddy's. We are fancy pansy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got your laugh on that one. Nice. You did. Good. So uh, we're continuing with the Ultimate Timeline um, from Game Theory, um, Game Theorist. And so this is uh, Burn Them All, part three. So don't know if we're going to go on to part four or not. We've heard, I've heard like mixed reviews on part four that like basically uh, it was way more theory than, than the other ones. And like it's already kind of uh, outdated because of the fact mm. that like Five Nights at Freddy's lore changes like it just changed right now. Like but while, while I'm speaking about this, it just changed. Like that's how crazy <laughs> it is. It's like crypto. Um, so... <laughs> If you want all of our Five Nights at Freddy's reactions, check out the description of this video. We got a playlist there for you. Are you ready? I think so. Okay. Burn them all. Burn them all. Hello, Internet. Did Welcome to Game, Game Theory and page 20 of our final FNAF timeline. This is getting ridiculous. Last <laughs> time we covered William Afton's rise as a serial killer, how the loss of his young son in 1983 caused him to make one fateful promise that would ultimately serve as his driving force for decades. I will put you back together. Fueled by grief and obsession, Afton would lose himself in work and drinks. One night in a fit of rage, he lashes out against Henry's young daughter, Charlie, his first murder. This moment moment becomes the first domino to fall in a long sequence of events that ultimately destroys William's life and the lives of those around him. That one murder gives Afton a taste for blood, resulting in the deaths of 10 more children across yeah. two different pizzerias. Those children go on to possess animatronics, giving Afton his first exposure to Remnant and the potential solution for bringing his son back to life. The need to learn more about this miraculous power leads him to produce the Funtime animatronics, as well as their capture devices, robots designed to bring kids to him for experimentation and collection of more remnant. Except there was one thing that he didn't account for. His daughter's curiosity. He made the robots too appealing and it would cost him Elizabeth's life. Now with two children to put back together, Afton was more desperate and crazed than ever, returning to defunct pizzerias to steal the possessed metal still living inside their walls. What he didn't account for, though, were the ghosts, forcing yeah. him to pay for the sins of his past. When last we left him, William was springlocked, oh. leading to death behind a secret wall. Gone, but certainly not forgotten, as we're about to see in today's video. Today we're finishing up chapter Chapter 2 of our story, wrapping up the Afton era. Over the next six pages, we switch our focus to the other main character of the franchise, Mike, a young boy dealing with the fallout of a stupid childhood decision mm. with tragic consequences. Mm -hmm. A young man whose life is best described as collateral damage, caught in the blast Oof. radius of William's whirlwind of destruction. Now, before we begin, let me just rip off the band-aid now. We won't be finishing the timeline. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry I wanted to, but covering FNAF VR, AR, and Security Breach wound up taking me an additional nine pages of script. And I've already made you wait long enough for this part, so I just had to make the executive call to break this one up into two. Don't worry, that part is already written, it is already recorded, it is just in the process of being edited. It is a hefty episode. So mark it on your I calendar, that one's actually going to be going live on March 25th. It's also coming complete with a live talk back where we go back over everything from the past couple episodes, as well as having ourselves some very special guests. So overall, that one should be a lot of fun. Fair warning though, the conclusions we've reached that solve security breach, whew, they are controversial. I, I feel mm. good about them. Like, I think that we've locked in on a lot of the answers here, but uh, oh, they're gonna raise a lot of discussion. Let's just say that you're either gonna love that episode or hate it. I don't really think there's <laughs> Maybe that's why some people are saying skip that one. Anyway, mm. without any further ado, let's cover a chunk of the timeline that's a lot less controversial. Let's meet Mike. <laughs> William still wasn't back. Weird. Michael knew his father sometimes traveled for work, disappearing for days on end, but usually there was some sort of notice. A phone call, a post-it, something. It's not like Michael and his father were close. Far from it. But as a household of two suffering men coping with years of tragedy and loss, there was at least some element of communication between the two of them. They were united by a name and a shared pain. This time, though, things felt different. William had left nothing. His absence was longer. There were no check-ins, no updates, just silence. Something had happened. If there was one one thing Michael knew about his father, it was that he had contingencies, safety checks, backup plans. His father was a careful and guarded man. He held his cards close to his chest, and as such, William had prepared him in the event that something like this ever happened. Normally, his father kept his home office locked, but in the event of an unexpected, prolonged absence, Michael had been instructed to enter his father's office and look behind an empty set of shelves mounted in the corner of the room. Rolling his eyes, Michael entered the office. He never fully understood how William was able to spend so many hours of his days locked up in here. There was just nothing to do. Most of this place was empty. He dragged himself over to the shelf in the corner, expecting to find an emergency contact list, a family safety deposit box. But what he actually found there was completely unexpected. Father, it's me, Michael. I did it. I found it. 
It was right where you said it would be. The shelf swung open and revealed a giant I know, industrial right? elevator. One that led straight down into an underground bunker. But, but that was impossible. Hidden inside his childhood home was a secret entrance to an enormous underground science lair? It yep. didn't make any he sense. Not. Seriously, it didn't make any <laughs> sense. And yet, here it was, mapped directly underneath the floor plan of the house that he'd grown up in, lost his brother in, been tortured in. Michael thought that he'd known his father a prideful, sad, angry man with petty everyday problems, but clearly he'd been living with a stranger this entire time. His father had secrets. Suddenly the days of William being mm -hmm. locked inside of his office made sense. He'd been here the entire time. Where was here though? Was this Circus Baby's entertainment and rentals? The Circus Baby restaurant always did seem to be a deeply personal project for father. A failure of his that cut unusually deep, especially after that first location had to be closed prematurely due to the gas leaks. After that day, father really did seem to change, to lose himself even more in his work. Clearly the entrance he had found was some sort of secret back way into the facility, one that required crawling through vents to navigate. His father had been working here, but in secret. Why? And that's when he found her. At the end of the facility, Circus Baby. His father's pride and joy. Except something was different about her. She wasn't like the others. The way she talked, the stories she told. This wasn't just a robot. She was alive, somehow. And not only was she alive, she also felt familiar. There is something bad inside of me. I'm broken. I can't be fixed. Will you help me? Was this his sister? William's baby girl? But how? Why? What was this place? He dug around some old files and found blueprints outlining the features of these animatronics. Storage containers, voice mimicking, parental tracking. And was that a child in Freddy's stomach? Was his father collecting oh and experimenting on kids? Were all the rumors that he'd heard throughout his past actually true? That the animatronics came to life at night? That there were murders done in all the pizzerias? That his father had somehow been the prime suspect in all of it. Suddenly, Michael's mind flashed back to his persistent nightmares throughout his childhood. Had he been experimented on too? Tears mm -hmm. stung in his eyes as anger, fear, and confusion filled his body. His father's secrets were pouring out. William wasn't just a lame, overworked father. He was a monster, toying with life itself. Suddenly, everything clicked. He frantically looked around the room, blinking human heads on poles, staring back at him. Oh. Green eyes, his sister. Blue eyes, his brother. Closed eyes, his mom. All just staring mm. expectantly. Oh. These were meant to be human. William was working down here trying to make believable humans, literally rebuilding the family that they had both lost. The small little girl robots with their British accents roaming the hallways of oh this God, underground no. facility suddenly took on a whole new context. Oh my gosh. Oh hell no. Were those meant to be his sister? A replacement for her? A clone? Was William building clones of his sister? They seemed to know him, after all, to react to his presence. They were all there. They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. He always did have a bit of a resemblance to his father. Michael's mind reeled as the reality of his world crumbled to dust. No, no, he had to get them out of there. If this really was his sister, heck, if any of these things were human, so Souls, whatever remnant of the humans that they once were, they needed to be rescued. They always put us back inside. There's nowhere for us to hide here. Led by the voice of Circus Baby, he marched through the now empty halls of the Funtime Auditorium. He would lead them. He would protect them. And finally, he would be able to forgive himself for the killing of his brother so many years. Huh. You are in the scooping room now. Ooh. I'm sorry, the what? The scooper only hurts for a moment. Scooper? That violent extraction arm? Michael had seen that one in the pile of blueprints. Something about heat rendering the magical silver metal inside useless. In reality, prior to getting himself springlocked and put behind the wall, William's methods had become increasingly sophisticated, with a mechanized arm that could infuse new bodies with a soul. William could finally give and take away life. The only thing he needed were the bodies. But William wasn't the only one looking for bodies, as Michael was about to learn. But if we looked like you, then we could hide. If we looked like you, then we would have somewhere to go. Michael was going to be the hero to help these animatronics, all right. He was going to help the haunted tubes and wires of these animatronics escape, just not in the way that he anticipated. His sister uh -huh. had lied to him, another game of pretend. The scooper plowed forward, digging its extraction arm into his body. As he heard <sighs> his bones ripping through his flesh, Michael blacked out. But something is wrong with me. I should be dead, but I'm not. 
For the next several months, Michael's life was not his own. He was forced to comply with the tangle of wires and spirits that lived inside of him. His body felt like an overfilled balloon begging to that burst as sucks. day by day, week by week, his flesh began to sag and discolor. He was a walking, talking, rotting corpse, alive oh but wishing God. he wasn't. He was a puppet, a walking shell. And while he did his best to conceal his fate, there was only so much a man filled with robot spaghetti could do. <laughs> the entity in his innards would eventually leave, but... Ugh. At that point, the damage had been done. His decaying flesh stank, turning him into a literal purple guy. But still, even with no bones, even with rotting purple flesh and begging to die, Michael continued to live. That silvery metal remnant injected by the scooper meant that he couldn't die. His anger also refused to die. What he had seen down there in his sister's location had rocked him to his core. His father had killed and captured dozens. His experiments had killed his sister and then tortured him throughout all his childhood. He was actively trying to build human replicants. He didn't know where his father was, but Michael knew that he was out there somewhere. I've been living in shadows. There is only one thing left for me to do now. I'm going to come find you. Michael had to correct for the sins of his father. He had to make things right. Michael would burn Fazbear Entertainment to the ground. I mean, what else could you do when your skin was permanently purple? Michael's yeah, sure. strategy was simple. He would apply for night security guard positions at the old defunct pizzeria locations. That way, no one ever had to see him or smell him during his shift. <sighs> all these old shuttered locations did need guards. Teenage vandals and squatters were always looking to get inside these abandoned buildings, and yet no one ever really wanted to work an overnight graveyard shift unless they were practically out of options. Enter Mike. One by one, he would take on the job of security guard, changing his name each time to ensure that no one was able to follow his paper trail. Once inside, he could tamper with the animatronics and figure out how they worked, writing about his experiences in his security logbook. While there, he would listen to the old tapes where upper management awkwardly welcomed new recruits to their summer jobs, even though he was working there nowhere near the summer months. He heard the gory details of his father's franchise from the outsiders looking in, confused and afraid about what was happening in the walls around them. Sometimes, he would see his brother in the form of the Golden Freddy suit. It's me appearing on the walls around him. Except now, there was something else there. He was no longer alone. Another angrier presence was also in the suit, as if two spirits were forced to share the same body. And Golden Freddy would attack him now. It was aggressive. Its vengeance wanted to lash out at anyone with the Afton name. Anyone who wore a security guard outfit. Over time, Mike worked his way through the old restaurants. The original pizzeria, the bigger, better Freddy Fazbear's. He spent weeks there looking for clues as to his father's whereabouts. And each time, at the end of his week shift, he would then set the location on fire. Remnant can't survive high temperatures after all. So burning away whatever spirit-laden animatronics that still existed inside seemed like a winning strategy. There. All this oh, revisiting creepy. of his past, though, was causing the nightmares to begin again. Hallucinations that brought him back to his childhood. The guilt around killing his brother. His dreams were oddly mixed with the shrill phone calls of the security guards. But it would all be worth it in the end. The goal was to eventually, eventually stumble across the one location, the one job that would finally reunite him with his father. Little did Mike know that that day would come sooner than he expected. 2023, an advertisement came across Mike's TV. Fazbear Frights, a new horror attraction inspired by the awful crimes that occurred around Freddy oh. Fazbear's pizza so many years ago. It made Mike sick. People yep. looking to make a quick buck off the tragedy of others, off his own family. This wasn't a joke or entertainment. Regardless, he had to be a part of it. If this team was combing through his family's history, they might stumble across something that could be useful. And if his father was truly still alive as he suspected, there would be no way that he wouldn't show up here. Maybe finally, finally this could be the final chapter in his family's marathon of tragedy. Mike applied for the job and was immediately handed the keys. Years of doing this had taught him that security guards rarely receive thorough security checks. They also liked how creepy Mike looks looked. Human. He had a costume on theme for the job. What little they knew. Hey, hey, glad you came back for another night. I promise it'll be a lot more interesting this time. For weeks, there was nothing. But just as Mike considered giving up, he received the call that he'd been waiting for for years. You're not gonna believe this. We found one. A real one. Could this finally be him? Sure enough, there he was. William inside his iconic golden Bonnie Springlock suit. Only now it was green and decaying with age. And there they were. A small family of broken men finally reunited. It's been a long time, Dad. Mike had always struggled with the phantoms of his past haunting him, but now all the animatronics he'd encountered over the past months Ooh. hopping from pizzeria to pizzeria suddenly sprang to life. Their burned faces haunting him as he tried to keep track of his father on the cameras. It would seem that William's mere presence had put the spirits on high alert. Ultimately, they were harmless, more annoying than anything else, but there was one that felt different from the others, one that was more than just a mere phantom, the security puppet. If he looked at the cameras at just the right moment, he could see it floating there through the halls. He could even see its reflection in the water pooled on the ground. It would seem like 
he wasn't the only one there on a mission. While he was dealing with Springtrap, Michael assumed that this one was likely dealing with the spirits of this place, finally setting him to rest. Hopefully this means a happier day for all of us, Mike thought to himself. And in that moment, he felt the air around him release, like pressure being let out of a bottle. The building sighed, as if five spirits had finally been allowed to move on. He had the sense that his brother was a part of them. He rigged the wiring inside the building to misfire, and the dry, desiccated walls erupted in flames. It is finished. No. Except it was not. Yeah. Somehow, through sheer force of will, Afton remained. He had survived, and Mike would need to find a new way of finishing off his father. Luckily, the solution would present itself later that year. Not from Mike, but from another victim that had been left in his father's wake. We're talking about becoming a Fazbear Entertainment franchisee. Restaurant ownership and management. Something almost anyone can do with a limited degree of success. You are now the face <laughs> of the newly rebranded Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Fazbear Entertainment is a brand had been closed for years. William had been stuck in a suit and a wall. The only person who legally could bring the franchise back was Henry, but he'd largely pulled out of the franchise around the time of his father's disappearance. Something was up. Surely this had to be some kind of a trick, right? Mike, doing what he did best, applied for a franchise and immediately got the job. There was just one thing out of the ordinary. Paragraph four. If you are playing this tape, that means that not only have you been checking outside at the end of every shift, as you were instructed to do, but also that you have found something that meets the criteria of your special obligations under paragraph four. No employment contract what? he'd ever signed required yeah. him to keep special lookout for independently moving animatronics outside the restaurant. Now he knew something was up here. Henry was luring them all back. Rather than trying to go to them, like Mike had done for years, Henry was doing the opposite. He was putting them all under the same roof. He was finishing them off for good. Mike knew this wasn't meant to be a restaurant. It was meant to be a prison, a containment vessel, a locked box meant to trap them all in so they could finally end the madness. It took a few nights, but eventually everyone was there. His father, the puppet, the robot spaghetti that had once violated his body, and his sister, now hopelessly devoted to serve the man that had once gotten her killed. It was time. He had been instructed to seal the doors and leave, but while he locked everything down, he didn't move on. If this was truly meant to be the end, if the remnant needed to be washed away, he needed to be a part of that. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found yeah, this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most of you, I believe there is peace and perhaps more waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell <laughs> has opened to swallow you whole. Yep. So don't keep the devil waiting for and with that, it was over. The Afton nice legacy line. died with all of them trapped inside of a literal box. As the flames danced around the office, Mike, for the first time in decades, was happy. But William wasn't gone yet. Although the darkest pit of hell was open and waiting for him, something or someone wouldn't allow him to move on. Instead, he found himself locked in moments from his past. The pizzeria, his son's room, his underground bunker. It was as if his brain's neurons were all firing at once, overloaded, mixing and matching all his biggest fears, regrets, failures. What mm -hmm. was this place? How did he get here? He called out into the silence. <laughs> Then they started coming. Without warning, animatronics, both new and old, began to jump out at him, bite him, rip him limb from limb. The pain was immeasurable. Make it stop. Make it stop. William, for the first time, longed for death, an end to this torture. Just as it felt like he couldn't take it anymore, everything was quiet again. It was as if the world had been reset. There was a brief moment of quiet, and then the onslaught began again. Dozens of faces from his past all Good. focused on him. A waking nightmare that he couldn't escape from. More pain. More ripping. It was his own personal hell, but why? Why couldn't he just die? And then he saw them, a group of characters he never thought he'd see again. Those janky, stolen characters hmm. that had started everything. The mediocre melodies. It had all started to go wrong once they showed up, once Henry had made them. But mixed in with their obnoxious southern drawls, William heard something else. It was barely a whisper, but he could just make out the words. He tried to release you. He tried to release us. But I'm not going to let that happen. I will hold yeah, you whisper here. afterwards. I will keep you here. No matter how many times they burn us. No. That voice. He knew that voice, but from where? Greetings from the fire. And from the huh. one you should not have killed. 
Oh my god. The one he shouldn't have killed. William fought back. He'd done a lot of awful things, but there mm -hmm. was always the one that stood out. Not Charlie, his drunken act of revenge. Not Susie, his first true murder, no. Instead, it was the one that he had lost control with. The one that he had broken beyond repair for no good reason other than because he could. The one that he'd stuffed inside the golden bear that his partner used to wear. Cassidy. They were back, and now they were trying to punish him. To make him suffer like he'd made them suffer. It was almost like William and Cassidy's souls had been locked together, fused by a collective rage and spite, each refusing mm. to move on. But while Cassidy was so focused on taking revenge, they actually did the one thing that would be the downfall for so many others. They kept William alive. Even though fire should have destroyed the remnant that was coursing through his being, Cassidy kept William breathing, paving the way for his escape. William's will was so strong, his soul so powerful that he managed to put a part of himself inside the circuitry that housed the Springlock suit. And there, his consciousness lay inside a single circuit board waiting, waiting for someone to find him and set him free, a person that no one would suspect. Okay, so a bit of a shorter chunk, but an important one as we <laughs> shift perspectives to Mike and tell his side of the story. And with FNAF VR, AR, and Security Breach having so much to explain, I didn't want to rush through things by trying to cram it all in here. Don't worry, I know you've all been patient. The final video is happening on March 25th. That is locked, it is getting ready to go. Trust me, I want this thing to be over and done with as much as you. I am not just stretching it out for the views. But before we wrap up for the day, I did want to talk about the big Orville elephant in the room, Mike's quest for revenge. You might have noticed that I was vague about the dates, and there's a good reason for that. I don't know them. There is no good way for me to make him fit in. Here's what I do know. We know with a high amount of certainty that Michael Afton is the character that we play as up until Ultimate Custom Night. Mike Schmidt and Fritz Smith, the security guards for FNAF 1 and FNAF 2 respectively, get fired for quote, tampering with the animatronics and odor. So weird connection between the two of them, right? But now, look at the phantom animatronics that are haunting us in FNAF 3. They use models from both FNAF 1 and FNAF 2, meaning whoever is sitting in that security guard chair, Fazbear Frights, they have to have seen both locations and their animatronics. And that's not all. Their designs are burnt. It's a weird detail in the game, and it's something that the character encyclopedia repeatedly calls attention to. The burned texture for these phantom animatronics. Why is that so unusual, though? Fazbear Frights is the first time in the franchise that we hear about anything burning down. From that point on in the story, it's like the characters turn pyro and are suddenly setting fires left and right. <coughs> but for the first three games, nothing ever catches fire. The animatronics are just moved or repurposed in some way. So when did they burn? And why would our security guards see them as being burned? Someone mm. has to have been going location to location, setting these places on fire, purging the sins of the past. We know we're definitely playing as Mike and sister location in FNAF 6 based on the in-game dialogue. And in FNAF 4, there's an Easter egg where we can hear the phone call from night one of FNAF 1, meaning that whoever's in that bedroom has heard the recording as a security guard. We also know that Mike has seen the nightmare animatronics based on his drawings Survival in the security logbook. logbook. So overall, there is solid evidence that connects all of FNAF's 1 through 6. You'll also notice how the character encyclopedia doesn't have a page for Mike Afton. This thing has a page for Chocolate Bunny Bonnie, but not Michael. Some tells me they don't want us to confirm how many games he's been in, because that would confirm too much of the theory. In short, this gives us an incredibly compelling and complete narrative. Mike as our protagonist, Mike and William his father as our antagonist. Mike accidentally kills his brother in Fredbear's mouth, which begins our story and sets William down his pathway of destruction. Mike is then haunted by the guilt of his past and is looking to make things right across the rest of the games. In Sister Location, he learns what his father's been up to and realizes what he has to do to correct it. After failing to finish the job in FNAF 3, he ultimately helps Henry end it all in FNAF 6. It is great. It is a clean narrative. There is just one problem, timing. Mike's quest can't really start until he's been down to sister location, seen baby, and gotten himself scooped. That's when he finds out about Afton's secret life. It's also when he's gonna start to smell, cause you know, he's a walking, talking, rotting corpse. And we know that he's not going down into the bunker until the Funtime animatronics have been made, Freddy's has been closed, and Afton is out of the picture. That all should be happening post-1993. After William is sealed behind a wall, but that then presents us with a few problems. Afton has already dismantled the original animatronics as we see in the FNAF 3 minigames. How are those things getting burned if they're already deconstructed? But more importantly, we see FNAF 2 paychecks with the date 1987. That is way earlier than I think it can be. To be fair, Fritz Smith's pink slip on night 7 doesn't have a date, but it's a bit weird to say that the first few nights are in 1987 and then employee number 3 is hired on years after the restaurant closes. Anyway, just wanted to call that out because I don't have a solid answer for it and I'd love to see your comments down below. And with that, my friends, this chapter comes to a close. We'll see you on March 25th for the grand finale as we cover the final three games in the franchise and the controversial answers we think solves what those games were trying to tell us. Okay, so, uh, man, Michael Afton, what a uh, just tragic story for just a tough life for that kid. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. I'm, I, I mean, as you were 
going into it and said Michael's name, all I could think was, what a tragic character. So we were exactly on the same wavelength. Yep. Um, a couple of things in this that just really stuck out to me. There was the, um, I don't know if you all can hear that. Bucky is in my lap and he's sleeping. But when he's sleeping, he tends to like dream about nursing. Yeah. So if you're hearing any kind of like, this is going to sound gross probably, but like sucking or swishing noises, <laughs> it's because the little puppy's in my lap, which is right below the microphone. <laughs> Anyway, moving on from that. A couple of themes in this that stuck out to me was, uh, one, the odor. If you have ever had the tragic misfortune of smelling something that has died, Oof. it is a very, very pungent, distinct odor, which is like one of those things that stands out to me in movies and stuff now. Mm -hmm. Like when the cops break into the room and they find the dead body and nobody is turning around to like hurl from the smell. I'm like, nope, not real. Because I, there was a, an animal that had died in my yard at one point as a kid. Um, it was only there for a couple of days, but that odor in and of itself was enough to knock me backwards. So, like, when they discover dead bodies that have been there for, you know, weeks or months. Just, like, inside up someplace, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, when they talk about the odor of Michael as he is this decaying, like, this, this live, contradictory, live dead body. <laughs> um, that's all that I could really think of was, like... Yeah, that odor. I mean, you're going to a job interview and you're dying and decaying. Like that odor knocks you back. So I'm really glad that he then talked about where he found that in the theory. And it was from these termination slips for these characters who were in part fired because of a messing with the animatronics and then odor. And the other thing that stuck out to me was that commercial for the Freddy Fazbear's Fright Fest and like mm -hmm. the desire to make money off of this family tragedy. And the first thing that popped into my mind was the Scream franchise, of all things, because I was just thinking about that, in essence, is like the life of Sidney Prescott. Like, her family has this tragic mm -hmm. history, and people try to capitalize on it by being that thing that people are going to make a movie out of. And then, oh, they made a movie, so we'll make the sequel, and then the other one, and the other one, and the other one. So I just, I love the parallels, and I can't wait to see how the new movie handles all of this lore yeah. and and makes sense of lore that is, as you said, constantly changing and evolving um, and sometimes highly controversial because fans believe one theory or another um, and we don't at this point know because they do seem to keep some of the concrete facts under lock and key so that we intentionally don't know what the actual reality is versus the different theories that are out there. So Michael's trying to make like amends for uh, his past sins of like, you know, with his brother and everything, but like he was a kid at the time too. And like, yeah. there's no, like, he obviously didn't intend for that to happen to, to his brother. It was just a, a poor choice and a mistake and a horrible mistake. Um, and then it's kind of like, it's not ironic. It's uh, it's just like, uh, I don't know if it's, it's not if it's po poetic. I don't know what the right word is, but like to have his, then his sister betray him Ooh, yeah. to, to, so that he ends up dying uh, in a very horrific way. Oh, God, um, yeah. Yeah, that was just, uh, I don't know, well, well written for that part. Um, and I'm wondering, though, like now, I mean, because Michael, I guess at the end, could have some sort of peace because he felt like he finally accomplished his mission of like freeing all the souls of killing his his father permanently and um, you know sending him to to where he belongs, um, but now that his father like has come back, I wonder if there's like in this universe there is a hell. I, I, I assume because that's what they kind of, kind of talked about and like him William going down there, um, even though he was kind of like trapped by uh, Cassidy. So if Michael is free, is he able to come back at some point? Mm. And knowing that uh, William's still alive, is he able to like come back and try to you know try to finish the job that he thought he had, uh, he had accomplished. Um, so I'd be curious about that. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why part of me loves the horror franchise in general is because it brings up ideas of some of these like supernatural elements. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what is your soul and what happens after death and all this stuff. Um, and I'm not saying that I necessarily buy into the idea of a heaven or a hell, but if they do exist, I think the way they portrayed it in this is very much in line with what I would imagine hell to be, which is essentially like, you've been a terrible person which has taken you there, and it's karma, and karma's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming back for you because you've earned it. And um, so that idea that he's constantly being murdered by the children in the animatronics that he killed, and yet he's unable to die, so he just has to keep reliving this like Groundhog Day, um, all I could think was like, yeah, 
well done. That's that's what I imagine yeah. a hell would be like for this guy. I'm just intensely, again, like I keep thinking about the movie that they're making on this because I'm so intensely curious as to how they handle this. This franchise is so rich in the storytelling and the history and the fans are so devoted to it and to figuring it out. Oh God, I really hope they do it well. <laughs> it could be so cool if they do it well. And I, I loved the idea of, what was it, Henry, uh, like, collecting all the robots and luring them back in and how this was going to be a prison for them. And uh, I mean, there's just, there's so much in this to enjoy from a horror perspective. Yeah. I mean, so you, and she is the uh, horror enthusiast out of us. So she's like, you know, she likes going back to this. I like getting scared. Yes, she does. <laughs> Let us know what you thought about this down below in the comments. And uh, if you think we should check out uh, part four or not, um, if it's like if it's worthwhile for us to check it out. I know he said that it's probably gonna be controversial. And um, like we're okay with like, you know, if it's not uh, you know, like absolute fact. We've been told before that like these are all just theories, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we still we're curious about checking it out. But if it's you don't think it's worth it, uh, let us know in the comments. And yes, uh, you know, if you disagree with someone else's comment, please be respectful. Yes, yes. Very important. If you want all of our Five Nights at Freddy's reactions, check out the description of this video. We got a playlist there as well as a link to our Patreon and get early ad-free access to reactions like this. Thanks so much for checking out our reaction for Five Nights at Freddy's, burn them all down, but just keep in mind. That our reaction is definitely not definitive.